Tornadoes are bearing down on the southern plains for a third straight night. Also tonight, a plane careened into a highway, killing a family headed to college graduation. For millions of Americans, allergy season is off to a miserable start as pollen counts explode. And Steve Hartman on the road with the perfect medicine to treat a deadly diagnosis. We started making it fun. Chemo? Yes. You made chemo fun? Yes. This is the CBS Evening News with Scott Pelley. Tonight, the seasons are colliding. There's a tropical storm warning in the Carolinas and in the Southern Plains, it's tornadoes. 63 twisters reported so far this week. This is what it looked like from inside a storm shelter north of Oklahoma City. Ferocious winds catapulting debris all over a farm. Tonight, with round three coming, storms are pummeling Texas east of Lubbock. Adriana Diaz is in North Texas. All right, this one means business. All week, Austin, this Saturday. has been the scene. Funnel clouds side. filling the sky. High winds and heavy rains have spawned multiple tornadoes throughout the night across three counties in northwestern Texas. Authorities say flash floods wiped out the train tracks, derailing 17 cars of this freight train in Valley View, Texas. Oh my God, a fire. A lightning strike caused this gas well to ignite and burn for hours near Denton, Texas. Especially in North Mark Texas, Fox with the National Weather Service says the damage was nowhere near what happened in Bridge Creek, Oklahoma on Wednesday. Definitely dodged a bullet. If this come over a little bit more populated area, it could have been a lot more. Just north of Oklahoma City, this cell phone video captured the powerful winds whipping debris right outside a storm shelter. Flash flooding remains an urgent threat. As much as four and a half inches of rain has fallen in some places over the last two days, causing rivers to overflow and damaging this era Texas elementary school, forcing it to close. Carl Canplin and his son Kevin lost their cattle in an eight foot flood surge from a nearby creek. They're now on a rescue mission to find their livelihood. You hate to lose one even when they're not worth much and when they are worth a lot, you really hate to lose one. The governor has put state emergency responders on alert because, Scott, as we head into the weekend, the worst may be yet to come. One death reported so far this week. Adriana, thanks very much. Larry Mowry is chief meteorologist at KTVT, our CBS station in Dallas-Fort Worth. Larry, what's in the forecast? Yes, Scott, a large part of Texas and Oklahoma remain under a tornado watch this evening. That's where the greatest threat of severe weather will be through the evening hours. Tomorrow, this exact same location with the threat of severe weather, two inch hail, winds to 70 miles per hour, and a high tornado threat again tomorrow across the central and southern plains. And on Mother's Day, the slight risk continues, a slightly lower threat for severe weather, but a higher flooding threat across this entire area. And tell us about the severe weather in the Atlantic. Yeah, we have subtropical storm Anna right now. You can see tropical storm warnings in effect from North Carolina all the way down to Charleston. This storm will slowly move towards the coast as we go into the weekend, spreading heavy rain and a threat for some high winds as we head into Saturday night and Sunday morning. I expect landfall sometime Sunday morning around Myrtle Beach to Wilmington with gusts as high as 55 miles per hour. That rain spreads into North Carolina through the day on Sunday, Scott. Larry Mowry of KTVT. Larry, thanks very much. It wasn't the weather today that sent a single engine plane careening onto a busy interstate in Atlanta. All four people on board were killed. They were on their way to a family celebration. Here's Mark Strassman. This cell phone video shows the highway fireball moments after impact. The pilot had radioed the tower right after takeoff. He was having trouble climbing. Then he said, going down. Motorists saw a plane 25 feet in the air and struggling. It burst into flames when it struck the median. And as I turned to get on the 285, boom, an impact. I'm, I'm it shook up. Up. Gerald Smith saw the plane head right for the semi he was driving. It's like it coming directly in my windshield. I slammed no brakes and by that time the plane came directly across my hood. It grazed his truck moments before crashing. Made my way out the truck to see could I help. By the time I got over there, it was blazed up so bad. It, it wasn't nothing nobody could do. The plane was a Piper PA-32 like this one, which seats six. Four people, 
Greg Bird, his sons Christopher and Philip, and Jackie Colzer, a fiance, were heading to Ole Miss to see another son's graduation tomorrow. Fire Captain Eric Jackson. Right now, uh, FAA uh, and representatives of, of NTSB are here on the scene. They are taking a look at the scene, taking a look at all the parts and everything that went into just how this plane crashed. That charred highway median behind me is where the plane crashed. The cause is still unclear. DeKalb Peachtree Airport lies in a congested residential commercial area, and for a pilot in trouble taking off, Scott, the highway is one of the only options. Mark Strassman in Atlanta for us tonight. Mark, thank you very much. One of the most notorious missing children's cases remains unresolved. Today, a judge in New York City declared a mistrial when jurors deadlocked in the trial of Pedro Hernandez, charged with murdering six-year-old Eton Pates in 1979. Hernandez confessed 35 years later, but there were doubts about his mental health, and one juror refused to convict. It was after Pates that missing children began to appear on milk cartons. Today, the Pentagon increased security at military bases throughout the nation, reflecting an increased concern over terrorism. We asked Homeland Security correspondent Jeff Pegues to look into this. ISIS propaganda has increasingly focused on attacking U.S. soldiers. The bulletin sent to military installations called for heightened awareness, but did not mention a specific target or plot. Since Sunday's failed attack in Garland, Texas, there has been a flurry of bulletins from federal agencies sent to law enforcement offices around the country. One says ISIS's messaging is resonating with U.S.-based violent extremists. Another says homegrown violent extremists may elude attention at attack with little or no warning. Going anywhere for a while. Everybody That's what happened at the Prophet Muhammad cartoon contest in Garland. The FBI told the Garland Police Department that Elton Simpson might be interested in the controversial event, but the Bureau did not know that Simpson and his accomplice, Nader Sufi, were planning an attack. FBI Director James Comey has said there could be thousands of people in the U.S. who are following ISIS propaganda online. The FBI prioritizes which to monitor most closely. Today, Comey held a conference call with representatives from about 500 police departments, urging them to share information. Ron Hosko is a former assistant director of the FBI. Does the FBI have the resources to keep up with these threats? No. The FBI is evolving, but the speed of change and opportunity uh, it has been one that's difficult for law enforcement and, and the intelligence community to, to keep pace with. The growing threat means there could be more surveillance of potential suspects. Scott, today, Director Comey asked state and local officials to take another look at closed investigations as well as cases that had been categorized as low priority. Jeff Pegay is in the Washington newsroom tonight. Jeff, thank you. There was an amazing sight in New York City today. Thousands of police officers lined up 10 and 20 deep to salute Officer Brian Moore, shot last Saturday in the line of duty. Busloads of cops came from across the country, California, Louisiana, Illinois, too many to count. 25-year-old Officer Moore was investigating a man with a gun when he was shot in the head. A suspect is in custody. As often in the NYPD, Moore's father was a cop, his uncle was a cop, and three cousins, too. Moore took the police entrance exam at the age of 17, and in his five short years, he won four service medals. In Baltimore today, lawyers for six officers charged in the death of Freddie Gray filed a motion to dismiss the charges or take prosecutor Marilyn Mosby off the case. They accuse Mosby of using inflammatory rhetoric after Gray's neck was broken in police custody. Separately today, U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch began an investigation of the practices of the Baltimore PD, and Chip Reed has been looking into what it means to live in Freddie Gray's neighborhood. In Sandtown, the violent, poverty-stricken Baltimore neighborhood where Freddie Gray lived, members of the charitable group Center for Urban Families walked the streets this week trying to help people find work. Good job training program up on Monroe. 
Despite monumental challenges, Joe Jones, the center's founder and CEO, is determined to turn this neighborhood around. 50% of African-American males between 20 and 30 are unemployed. You can't have that number of people out of the labor market and expect that a community is going to thrive. Over the years, there have been many efforts to save Sandtown. In the early 1990s, former President Jimmy Carter and presidential candidate Bill Clinton came here when developers and the city were pouring $130 million into urban renewal. The project largely failed because jobs did not materialize. About 50% of Sandtown households earn less than $25,000 a year. Only 6% of adults have college degrees. Only about half of eighth graders can read proficiently. One of the biggest problems here is that with so few jobs available, selling drugs on the street has become a rite of passage for many young men. Can I ask you how many of you have a criminal record? I did all of us. Just all of us. All of us. If you keep living in Sandtown, you're going to hustle. Hustle meaning sell drugs. Yeah. Absolutely. It's yeah, not that you're looking at what they're doing as illegal. It's what you see as, okay, this person is making money. They, they're feeding their family. But every member of this group is employed. They've overcome their pasts. Now their mission is to convince others that they too can pull themselves up, even in Sandtown. Chip Reed, CBS News. Baltimore. Turns out black unemployment has dropped in April below double digits for the first time in seven years. Today's jobs report shows the economy began to thaw from the dismal winter. 223,000 jobs were added. Unemployment dropped to 5.4 percent. That's also the lowest in seven years. Black unemployment was 9.6. But paychecks still aren't growing. Pollsters and pundits in the UK may be out of work after blowing the call on yesterday's election. They predicted a dead heat, but the conservative prime minister, David Cameron, scored a decisive victory. Mark Phillips on the British election that had a surprisingly American feel. David Cameron came back to number 10 Downing Street today as the leader of a majority government. A small majority, but one just big enough to govern. And for the defeated party leaders, there was a political bloodbath. I'm so sorry. Ed Miliband, Labour leader, resigned. I will be resigning as leader. Nick Clegg, of Deputy Prime Minister, Leadership resigned. Election. Nigel Farage of the right wing UK Independence Party, resigned. Not saying that I am standing down. Only the Scottish nationalists who wiped Labour out in Scotland also came out big winners. Having a go, that pumps me up. David Cameron's victory came after a campaign that had an undercurrent of nastiness. When the Labour leader broke political rule one by awkwardly eating a bacon sandwich on camera, the Tory press was ruthless. Miliband didn't look like a prime minister, they said. Now he won't be one. This despite Labour bringing in Obama election guru David Axelrod as a consultant. Both sides used American political pros. Another Obama aide, Jim Messina, helped mastermind the conservative win. For U.S. Republican pollster and CBS News consultant Frank Luntz, this was an election with a familiar feel. There's no commonality within the parties, there's no civility, there's no respect, and that makes the elections particularly negative, particularly divisive, and you've now got an electorate that's just plain cynical. And Scott, there's fallout from this vote. The strong showing by the Scottish nationalists may well lead to calls for another referendum soon on Scottish independence. The uncertainty isn't over yet. Mark Phillips outside the Houses of Parliament for us tonight. Mark, thanks. Some claim we've been hit by a pollen tsunami. Well, it's certainly nothing to sneeze at. And they flew today on the wings of history when the CBS Evening News continues. About 40 million Americans suffer from seasonal allergies, and this spring they're getting hit with a perfect storm of misery. Here's Dr. John LaPook. Just when everyone was done suffering through an awful winter, the late arrival of spring has brought a new misery. Its name etched in, well, pollen. Adriana Gutierrez suffers from allergies every spring. But today was so bad, she called in sick and went to the doctor for a skin test. Okay, not too bad. 
As you see, I'm very stuffy and my eyes and my skin is developing all these rashes right now. So really, trees are the main allergen for you, okay? This is what Allergist Dr. Cassia Charlot says it's been an especially bad week. We are seeing both patients who've had allergies previously, but never have had such severe allergy symptoms as they are experiencing now. And we are also seeing patients who are developing allergies for the very first time. Across the Northeast and in parts of the Midwest, tree pollen levels have been very high. Some of the worst cities include Burlington, Vermont, Buffalo, New York, and Cleveland, Ohio. Guy Robinson is a certified pollen counter for a National Allergy Academy and says any level over 90 is elevated. What was the most recent pollen count that you measured? Most recent one here was probably just over 2,000 per meter. Per is that high? Meter. What give us a yeah, sense? Yeah, that's considered very high. Anything over 1,500 is very high. One doctor said this year we're going to have a pollen tsunami. Now, is this a particularly bad year, or is, do people just forget how bad it was last year? I think, yeah, the latter. The, people forget the first week in May is usually the worst time of the year for, for most people who are going to have allergies. One tip for people suffering from pollen allergy, when you get home, take a shower and be sure to wash your hair. Otherwise, invisible pollen can keep sprinkling down. And Scott, don't wait too long to seek help. Medications often work best when given before symptoms get too severe. Dr. John LaPook, thanks, Doc. What was the woman doing with a boy in a suitcase? We'll show you next. Border guards in North Africa made a surprising find in a woman's luggage yesterday. A scanner showed an eight-year-old boy inside the suitcase. He's okay. He's from Ivory Coast. Authorities say the Moroccan woman was hired by the boy's father to smuggle him into Europe. There was a stirring sight over the nation's capital today. Dozens of World War II military aircraft marked the 70th anniversary today of victory in Europe, flying over the National Mall. One of the planes made an emergency landing at Reagan National after a hydraulic leak. Today, the Social Security Administration released the most popular baby names from 2014. Sophia was third for girls, Olivia was second, and Emma topped the list for boys. Mason was third, Liam was second, and Noah was number one for the second year in a row. A trip to the doctor leaves them in stitches. On the Road with Steve Hartman, next. Tonight's On the Road segment is sponsored by Tenna. Tenna lets you be you. Don't forget, Sunday is Mother's Day. Steve Hartman met a family that remembers mom not once a year, but every minute. It's Friday, so Steve's on the road. When 67-year-old Carla Wilson found out she had terminal cancer and that treatment would only prolong her life, not save it, this divorced mother of four was understandably depressed oh, more pills. and ready to give up. Until one day, her youngest daughter Robin suggested an unconventional treatment not to cure her cancer, just her attitude. You know, she was very confused, like, why are we doing this? I didn't want to, because I thought it was silly. Her daughter's idea? A nose job. They wore these to chemo one day. And that started the ball rolling. We started making it fun. Chemo? Yes. You made chemo fun? Yes. After the noses, every time they came here to the McKee Cancer Center in Loveland, Colorado, Robin convinced her mom to wear a different costume, from tie-dyes to tutus, from bumbling workmen to bumbling bees. What do you think? On this day, they went as Alice and the Mad Hatter. Hi. How's everybody doing? They always bring little gifts for the nurses and other patients. <laughs> and they say this cheerfulness has had a profound effect on Carla's attitude. Oh, thank you, honey. Yeah, it was like a switch. The mood changed. <laughs> changed dramatically. What started with the costumes has now spread to all aspects of their lives, a phenomenon they have dubbed Operation Choose Joy. <laughs> we couldn't stop it, and we couldn't contain it, and it, it hasn't been put down since. <laughs> of course, laughter and a positive attitude can only do so much. 
the cancer will eventually take Carla's life. But when that time comes, this Alice in Wonderland says she'll be able to look back on her mother's cancer fight through a truly unique looking glass. I think that that is one of the reasons why we keep doing it and why I'm so adamant about it because I think that I'm going to remember this as something that we enjoyed. Cancer treatment, something they enjoyed. I guess Alice can cross that off the list of impossible things. <laughs> Steve Hartman on the road in Loveland, Colorado. Call your mom. That's the CBS Evening News for tonight. For all of us at CBS News all around the world, I'm Scott Pelley. See you Sunday on 60 Minutes. Good night.